Good afternoon, everybody. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Michael Augenbraun. I'm the counselor for the ETA chapter of the Alpha Omega Alpha at SUNY Downstate College of Medicine, and I want to thank everybody for attending the meeting. Before we get started, I want to make three quick announcements. The first one is, despite the current apocalyptic snowfall predictions for the next day and a half, it should be noted that the vernal equinox occurred at 1215 today. <laughs> Happy spring to everybody. Tonight's uh, award ceremony and dinner will take place at 6.30 p.m. at El Karib Country Club in Mill Basin. And lastly, I do want to make a, a statement on April 5th at 11 a.m. in the Alumni Auditorium, AOA will be sponsoring with the participation of several clinical departments, a campus-wide clinical pathological conference, or CPC. CPCs are a traditional educational platform in medicine, and we've not had one here center-wide for a while. This will be taking place in conjunction with the College of Medicine second year transition to clerkship, and we're anticipating robust faculty and postgraduate training attendance to make it a truly institutional event. I hope you all can come. Now for today's activity. Uh, Alpha Omega Alpha is the National Medical Honor Society. It was founded in 1902 by William Webster Root and a group of like-minded medical students in Chicago in an effort to elevate what was then essentially a variably rough trade. Uh, there was a lot of drinking and carousing going on among medical students, which we know doesn't happen these days at all. Today, there are 120 chapters across the country, and they all continue the mission of AOA, which is to promote scholarship, leadership, professionalism, and service within the medical field. Now, you might think that promotion of such lofty goals in medicine would not require torchbearers like the AOA, but the vicissitudes of practice and those of modern life are such that someone or some group really needs to be out there reminding us on a regular basis of our ideals. Today we gather in part to recognize the 39 members of the class of 2018, the eight newly elected members of the class of 2019, the three alumni, six members of our postgraduate programs, and five members of the faculty, all of whom, through dedication to the ideals of AOA, have been elected to join the society. This year we're honored to have Dr. Wayne Riley present the Alpha Omega Alpha Lecture. Dr. Riley is, as you undoubtedly know, the 17th president of SUNY Downstate. He originally hails from New Orleans, and in perhaps an odd coincidence, it's long been noted that many people in New Orleans speak with what sounds like a Brooklyn accent. True, right? Now, I have not heard Dr. Riley in conversation flip the OI sound in words for R and vice versa, such as toity toid street, or oyster and erster, or substitute TH with D as in Dem and Doze, which you hear frequently in the hallways here, so. But maybe in the privacy of his home, when all the pressures of the day melt away and no one is around and he lets his hair down, he may just start to sound a little like Ed Norton from The Honeymooners. <laughs> Who knows, it could be true. Anyway, in his career, Dr. Riley has held several important leadership roles at important and distinguished healthcare institutions, including Baylor College of Medicine, Vanderbilt University, and Meharry Medical College. As a member myself of the academic organization that represents internists, the American College of Physicians, I want to recognize his recent tenure as the president of that important organization. And finally, Dr. Riley is a member of the prestigious National Academies of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. His topic today is one that does or should concern everyone who is connected with this institution, health disparities and inequities in care. As practitioners, researchers, and students at Downstate, we bear witness to the reality of this problem every single day. And if Dr. Riley's talk can inspire some of the young colleagues we have here today to seek solutions to this problem in their careers as they unfold, then I would judge it a very successful presentation. Please welcome Dr. Riley. Well, thank you and good afternoon and congratulations to our student, faculty, and alumni inductees into Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. This is a, a true achievement, uh, whether it happens as a student or as a faculty member or a house staff member uh, or even an alumnus. And uh, I'm a very proud member of this organization, ha having been inducted into uh, AOA by my alma mater, so I know how special it is. Um, so I want to also salute the parents and partners and 
uh, families of the inductees. We know that uh, uh, none of us get where we are without the love and support of those near and dear to us. So thank you so much for supporting your physician uh, in this uh, journey uh, to take care of others. Um, my task today is to talk to you a little bit about healthcare disparities because I think particularly members of this organization uh, should be aware of the challenges we have in medical care in the United States with regard to uh, treatment of different groups. And I'll take you through uh, sort of a level setting period, then talk about how we even got to know about healthcare disparities. And then some of the modern day dimensions of the healthcare disparities in terms of my personal view uh, of how you and I can become more effective advocates and to address healthcare disparities. So I hope you find this, this talk at least uh, conscience raising and consciousness raising, uh, but also as one, as I say, a call to action that whatever specialty you're in, uh, whether you're a general internist like myself, a surgeon, an ophthalmologist, radiologist, et cetera, we all can participate in uh, dealing with healthcare disparities and making sure that your patients get the care they need when indicated. So the first thing I'd like to do is, is first to just sort of level set that health disparities are not just uh, based on race, ethnicity, or, uh, and or cultural differences. But uh, many times uh, we, we do talk about healthcare disparities in these dimensions because they're the ones that are the most clear to us in the clinical setting. Uh, that we know that uh, our patients come in very different forms, particularly in a diverse community as ours here in central Brooklyn in New York City, uh, and in fact, increasingly, the United States of America in terms of its shifting demographics. Uh, but also, health disparities can result from lifestyle choices, our age, and sexual orientation. So again, further dimensions of how we can understand healthcare disparities uh, for all of our patients. Now, they can result from three main areas, and I think this is the ones that, that I know our students have been particularly acutely become aware of during their training. That first of all, access to health care continues to be a problem, uh, particularly here in central Brooklyn, uh, but also in other parts of the United States. I'm a southerner. It, we have deep health care disparities in my home state of Louisiana um, and, 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 and sort of just all over the deep south. Uh, but it is uh, the access to care that is still a key dimension, and I'll talk about that a little later. Also, personal, socioeconomic, and environmental characteristics can cause health care disparities. Uh, we pick up the newspaper any week uh, and read about issues with water quality and uh, sanitation and air quality, et cetera. And again, our patients live in communities where there are challenges along those dimensions, and sometimes we forget as physicians that we also, in addition to take care of patients, we have to think about communities where our patients come from. Next is the quality of health care. We do know that there is uneven quality with regard to health care in many parts of the country, even in New York City, even in the borough of Brooklyn. And that's really a, a call to action for all of us uh, to improve quality of care as much as possible. Now, Someone might say, well, Riley, why are racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare important? And I think it's number one. It's a moral and ethical dilemma, colleagues, that we must come to grip, grips with. That we know that healthcare is a resource that's tied to our notions of social justice. Uh, that we want all of our patients to have the same opportunities, both educationally and otherwise, that many of you and I have had and that it really does connect to the quality of life for individuals and groups in the United States. But we also have to think about it as a country, that the productivity of the United States of America is tied to the health status of all Americans, no matter what part of town you live in, what your race, ethnicity, whether you're rural or urban, the productivity and future of this country are incredibly linked to dealing and understanding healthcare disparities. We know that inadequate or poor care contributes to rising costs in health care. Uh, that is the challenge of the rest of your careers is the rising cost. It's been the, the issue in my career uh, since I graduated from medical school that we saw this increasing in GDP growth in the amount of health care that the United States uh, consumes uh, in comparison to other industrialized and, and fortunate countries. 
And then again, all of this has clear implications in terms of the quality of care that we want for everybody. Now, how do you define healthcare disparities? These are three definitions that I've uh, used in my career. Uh, health disparities refers to gaps in the quality of healthcare and healthcare across racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. Uh, HRSA describes it as population specific differences in the presence of disease, health, health, health outcomes, or access to healthcare. Again, that access thing we're going to talk about. And the Institute of Medicine, now known as the National Academy of Medicine, defines it as racial or ethnic differences in the quality of healthcare that are not due to access-related factors or clinical needs, preferences, and appropriateness of intervention. So you can see that these definitions converge and diverge a little bit in terms of how we describe healthcare disparities, how we define it, which are, again are important. Uh, now again, these are something we know pretty well here. Lack of insurance coverage is a problem in terms of accessing care. Lack of a regular source of care, whether that care is from a general internist like myself or a family physician like Dr. Sadovsky or a PA or a nurse practitioner, there is no regular source of care that contributes colleagues to healthcare disparities. Financial resources, we know that one of the things that we grapple with <clears throat> is uneven or access problems with healthcare because people lack a copay to go to a physician. Or the trip across town to get to us is so onerous that it's, it's a barrier to care. So financial resources are not to be uh, dismissed lightly with your patients. And sometimes you have to probe with your patients if they are experiencing healthcare uh, uh, financial resource issues that make it difficult for them to get back to see you or to get the surgery that you're recommending, et cetera. Legal barriers. We know there's legal barriers to care in some parts of the country. Structural barriers, meaning how we're organized. Um, the healthcare financing system, again, is very complicated. Even to you and I who are, have some level of sophistication about healthcare, this is still pretty confusing. Uh, I spend a lot of time every day trying to figure out the financial implications of what we do here in, in, at Downstate in terms of our patient care, uh, our market share, our offerings to the community, et cetera. And then again, the scarcity of providers. We know that some parts of New York City have more general in internists per foot than other parts of New York City. So again, the scarcity of providers can be a significant issue in terms of access to care. Now, let's talk about the diseases. Sometimes we forget. We see these statistics, but these statistics are so important, colleagues, that I think it's time that I spend a little more time on it. Infant mortality rates for black babies are 2.1 times higher uh, than for non-black non babies. Life expectancy for black men and black women is 3.4 fewer years of life compared with their white counterparts. Over the last decade, we have seen some improvement. The rates of death attributable to heart disease, stroke, prostate cancer, breast cancer remain much higher in African-American populations. Diabetes death rates are about two times higher in African-Americans and Native Americans as compared to non-Native Americans and non-African-Americans. And that minorities remain grossly underrepresented in healthcare professions workforce relative to the populations in the country. These are real statistics that sometimes we see but don't really think about in the context of how it contributes to healthcare disparities. Now, the sobering facts. At no time in the United States recorded history has the health status of minority populations equaled or come close to that of non-minorities. Think about that. At no point in the history of the United States of America has the health status of minority populations even approached uh, non-minority citizens. So again, that tells you how intractable this problem is in terms of just the history of this country. Just about all racial and ethnic groups experience higher rates of illness and death. Minorities are less likely to be given appropriate cardiac medications or undergo bypass surgery. And we'll talk about cardiovascular care very shortly in more detail. But these are some of the sobering facts. Continued, 25% of the hospitals that are the most crowded care for nearly 90% of elderly African Americans. Racial and ethnic minorities suffer from worse health, receive lower quality of care than whites, regardless of income, insurance coverage, or where they live. Doesn't matter if you have health insurance or that you live in a better zip code, we still have disparities in terms of how racial and ethnic minorities get the care. 
So again, we sometimes think, oh, it's just a money thing. No, it's not just a money thing. Because even when you control and when similar socioeconomic status, you still have issues with regard to health disparities. African Americans are more likely to undergo a le leg amputation or develop uh, peripheral vascular disease. The age adjusted rate for African Americans is 17, death rate for African Americans is 17% higher than non Hispanics or whites. African Americans are significantly less likely than whites to receive major therapeutic procedures in 77 disease categories. African Americans with coronary artery disease or a history of heart attack are significantly less likely than whites to receive appropriate procedures or therapies. And African Americans are less likely to receive recommended cardiovascular medications, sometimes even a simple aspirin. It's been documented in the literature that African Americans and minority patients don't get the care per the guidelines that they need to get. Continued, African American women are more, four times more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth regardless of socioeconomic status or education status. How many of you are aware of what happened to Serena Williams? Great tennis star, she almost died after her baby was born. And this is a woman who is a multimillionaire, Wimbledon champ several times over, Grand Slam titles, probably one of the greatest tennis players ever play tennis. And here she was talking about her near-death experience after delivering her child. Uh, again, again, highlights the fact that even a Serena Williams has issues in terms of uh, health care disparities. Uh, we, we now know that there's documentation that uh, racism itself is literally bad for your health. Discrimination is a type of stressful life experience that has negative effects on health similar to other kinds of stressful experiences. And this has been well documented in the psychological, psychological literature and other uh, studies that really do highlight that discrimination does contribute to disparate uh, healthcare outcomes. Uh, it leads to more rapid development of coronary artery disease. Pregnant women who report high levels of discrimination give birth to babies who are lower birth weight than others. Uh, racial differences in the quality and intensity of care persist for African Americans irrespective of the quality of the insurance they have irrespective of their education, as I mentioned, or irrespective of their job status. These are the sobering facts that, we, again, we have to uh, embrace and understand in the context of our professional lives. Now, even in the opioid crisis, that's in the news lately. Uh, the opioid crisis is clearly getting worse, but it's particularly getting worse for African Americans. It's largely been perceived as a white rural phenomenon but it also has a striking impact in urban communities among African Americans. And according to the CDC, drug deaths among blacks in urban counties rose by 41% in 2016. So again, the headlines don't tell the complete story, colleagues, that this is a significant problem for all communities. Now, if you look at the opioid deaths per 100,000 by race between 2000 and 2015, you'll see some very interesting trends for Hispanics, here, for African Americans here, for whites, and then look at how the urban and rural dimension adds to it too. So again, this is a complex problem that we're just now beginning to address as, as a profession, as a country, in terms of both public and health policy. The opioid crisis is real, and it does have significant impact on minority communities. Now, this is a map that shows you the 2016 drug overdose deaths per 100,000 residents. The darker the color, the higher the rate of deaths. And look where it clusters in the upper Midwest, in the west coast of Florida, north of my hometown in Louisiana, just, just north of New Orleans, from New Orleans all the way up to the Mississippi line. Uh, you have large pockets in Oklahoma, New Mexico, the northern part of California, so again, this is a beautiful uh, uh, a picture that highlighted where the opioid deaths are tending to occur. My old hometown in Nashville, we have a significant problem in Nashville in terms of opioid deaths in rural Tennessee, East Tennessee in particular, uh, Middle Central Tennessee uh, as well, and also in the Memphis area close to uh, Arkansas and the Mississippi line. Uh, so again, you can see how, how the country is really suffering with this, this opioid epidemic. Uh, and again, in terms of Latinos and Hispanics, we have similar concerns. Hispanics are less likely 
uh, the non-Hispanics to receive major procedures in 38 of 63 different disease categories, almost twice as likely as non-Hispanic whites to die from complications of diabetes, something we should all be vigorously improving upon. Uh, again, among our Native American patients around the country, disproportionately die from diabetes, liver disease, cirrhosis, and unintentional injuries, particularly firearm inju injuries. So again, even the Native American communities, there are significant disparities. Now let's talk about rural areas. Rural areas have uh, worse health outcomes in general, less access to care. Uh, and in those areas, Medicaid plays a central role in helping to fill gaps in private coverage in rural areas. That's why the Medicaid program is critically important to ameliorating health care disparities. And I'll talk about it vis-a-vis -vis the Affordable Care Act shortly. Americans living in rural areas suffer from higher rates of everything, chronic disease, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, arthritis, high cholesterol, higher rates of disability or death due to unintentional injury. Again, mostly firearms or in, in rural areas, uh, tractor accidents, et cetera, motor vehicle accidents, et cetera. So again, rural areas have disparate uh, healthcare uh, is issues as well uh, that again, we have to come to grips with. Now, how did we get to this point in terms of describing healthcare disparities? Well, this is it, 1985. Uh, I had just begun my first job after graduating from Yale, uh, and in 1985, uh, the Malone Heckler report came out. Margaret Heckler uh, was the then Secretary of Health and Human Services under President Reagan, and it was, it was her belief that, my gosh, she's seeing all these data reports about high deaths among African Americans and Latinos. She said, we got to study this. So she put together a team with Tom Malone, a distinguished uh, NIH uh, scientists, and it became known as the Heckler Malone Report uh, on Black and Minority Health. And this was the first time it had ever, ever been studied systematically in an academically rigorous way was in, when Secretary Heckler uh, commissioned this study along with Tom Malone. It was issued in uh, 1985, and this is what it said, or what happened. When this report came out, literally shockwaves were generated in that August when she issued the report when Secretary Heckler said there was a continuing disparity in the burden of death and illness experienced by blacks and other minority Americans as compared with our nation's population as a whole. She continued, the black experience of poor health status, poor health outcomes, and limited access for 366 years before 1985 was well known to African American and a, uh, some, uh, some African Americans and a small group of governmental officials, a tiny group of academics, but was not appreciated by the general public until this report had been put out. We had an anecdotal feeling that, wow, we're seeing a lot of this, we're seeing a lot of that, but, we're, but nowhere else, nowhere, and no, at no time was it ever codified in rigorous data collection. Um, it highlighted the fact that there was a continuing disparity in the burden of death and illness experienced by black and other minority Americans as compared with the nation's population. That ever since accurate federal record keeping began, she went on to highlight what we call excess mortality. Excess mortality for the students here is a death that could be present, prevented if but for an intervention. Uh, the Malone Heckler report highlighted that there were excess mortality in six medical conditions between white and blacks. And that accounted for 86% of black excess mortality when compared to the rest of the population. And 42.5% of deaths up to age 70 were considered to be excess deaths. Deaths that could have been avoided, colleagues, if but for medical care or an intervention. Almost 50% of the deaths before 70 could have been avoided. And again, this, was, this sent shockwaves through the medical community because it, again, Secretary Heckler said it best. She said, although our health charts do itemize steady gains in the health status of minority Americans, the stubborn disparity remained an affront both to our ideals and to the ongoing genius of American medicine. I felt passionately that it was time to decipher the message inherent in that disparity. That's the secretary's words. And so this was the first time that a comprehensive look at minority health had been accomplished. And we owe a large debt of gratitude to Secretary Heckler uh, for putting out this report. Now I will say the more cynical amongst us will remember 
um, that shortly after this report uh, came out, Secretary Heckler was mysteriously reassigned to become ambassador to Ireland uh, in the Reagan administration. Um, but she was a good, loyal servant, and she went off to Ireland and served as ambassador before retiring. She's still alive, a former congresswoman from Pennsylvania, and she's been revered figure in, in minority health because she took on a very difficult problem that the federal government had never waded into. Uh, now, remember I talked about the conditions that really contributed to disparity in care. Well, these are the usual suspects, colleagues. This is what we see here at Downstate at UHB in our clinics and all over New York City. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, asthma, cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, HIV AIDS, mental health, chronic kidney disease. These are the conditions with significant racial and ethnic and socioeconomic dimensions that we grapple with in our community. Now, remember 1985, fast forward to 2003. Between 1985 when the Heckler Report was put out and 2003, it was pretty much radio silence in terms of health disparities, in terms of an academic rigorous review. But because of the growing body of evidence, the Institute of Medicine, the then Institute of Medicine, now renamed the National Academy of Medicine, uh, commissioned a major report called Unequal Treatment, confronting racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. Again, using the heft of the Institute of Medicine to really highlight and punctuate and build upon the work that Secretary Heckler and Tom Malone started with that first report. So what they did, they said, okay, we know all these pointy-headed academic physicians all over the country were saying, well, that really wasn't as rigorous as it should have been, and you know, that, that was a federal report. We need something more academic. Well, this is it, colleagues. They went back and looked at 10 years, over a 10-year lifespan. There were over uh, 600 articles in the medical literature published in three decades. But of that 600, they went back and looked at the most high quality 100 of those 600 and looked at those articles to see around these dimensions. Again, those diseases I just showed you. They said, okay, let's go back and look at the best papers out of that 600 and see what it shows us. And this is what the integrated model of health disparities that they came up with, the Institute of Medicine, where you have to look at the quality of health care on this axis. Uh, minority and non-minority patients, and then you see this difference, that there is a difference in terms of minority and non-minority uh, patients in terms of their experience in terms of that difference, that gap, that disparity. And how does that break down? Three dimensions, clinical appropriateness and need of, of the patients, the operations of the healthcare system and legal and regulatory climate, discrimination, bias, stereotyping, and uncertainty, results in disparity. You, so as you can see, there's not one thing that results or causes healthcare disparities. It tends to be a confluence of these three dimensions that lead to this difference and then lead to this disparity. Now again, our awareness of healthcare disparity and discrimination has been slow to come, but again, this was the study that really punctuated it. I will, I will never forget, I was in my clinic at the VA in Houston, Texas, seeing patients one day, and one of my veterans patients came in with an article from USA Today. And uh, one lesson that I have learned uh, is sometimes medical uh, breakthroughs get to the newspaper faster, nowadays it's to the website, faster than we get to the journal. So my patient brought this in, he said, Doc, look at this, that there's a difference in the terms of how physicians recommend cardiac catheterization. And for the non-physicians in the room, uh, cardiac catheterization is how we, it's a procedure. We can look into the three blood, uh, blood vessels of the heart to see where there's blockage. If there's blockage, we can do a uh, percutaneous uh, intervention, meaning a rotor-rooter procedure or an angioplasty to clear out that blockage. We can put stents into the artery so that it doesn't collapse. Again, those interventions are known to prevent heart attack and stroke in, in many individuals. So this was a study that was published that again hit the medical journal, the USA Today, and it's highlighted the fact that there had been a survey administered at a national medical meeting. Listen to this, a national medical meeting of an unnamed medical organization that I used to be uh, a president of um, that developed a computerized survey that said, 
what do you do about these patients with chest pain who present to your office? It was a computerized thing. We went, to, folks went into this little phone booth thing and took this little quiz. And the, they had actors on the screen who portrayed patients with, with the same characteristics and, and had a scripted interview about their situation. These are the patients. You had four black, four white patients, uh, two women, and uh, four women, four men. And the patients had all the same demographic information. They all were employed. They all had the same insurance. They all had the same laboratory st st uh, studies. They all had the same EKG, same chest X-ray finding, et cetera. Well, guess what happened? It found that there were differences in the rate at which the African-American patients were recommended for cardiac catheterization compared to the non-African-American patients. Even more telling, the lowest rate of recommendation for cardiac catheterization went to the African-American women. And I'm sure that the faculty have taught our students that women have subtle presentations of coronary artery disease. I can't tell you how many women patients I've had in my career as a general internist who will come in and say, Dr. Howe, I'm just tired all the time. I, I don't want to play with my grandchildren. And I say, okay, let's check some things out. Listen, you know, let's order a stress test, voila abnormal stress test, and she's in the cardiac catheterization lab within two or three days, just complaining of fatigue. Women do not present with crushing substernal chest pain classically described in all the, chest, in all the textbooks. Well, again, the, the symptoms by the African-American women were minimized as compared to the others. So this, again, was a very uncomfortable study for the House of Medicine to get a grips around is that groups of family physicians and general internists had disparate treatment decisions based upon a patient's race. Colleagues, this should not happen. And so again, this was a study that was published in 1999 that hit the press that really raised the issue of, well, there has to be subtle bias in medicine. That we know that people are not ordering things that they should uh, based on a patient's uh, race, et cetera. So now, Going back to the IOM report, if you think about how this all happens, this is an integrated model of healthcare disparities. And here, this is us, the physician, the patient input. Uh, you have a physician, a patient. You have the data, the physical exam, the diagnostic test. You have the social, economic, and cultural influences. You have our interpretation of the data. You have the subjective perception of everything that the patient articulates. But then you have the specter of stereotyping, prejudice, conscious and unconscious bias that then contributes to some intervention or not and lead at some points and sometimes and in some encounters to racially disparate clinical decisions. So again, this is, an, this is what the IOM put out there is a causality model of how we need to get a better grip in terms of dealing with healthcare disparities amongst our patients. Now, uh, you know, I mentioned cost. There is a cost to healthcare disparities, colleagues. This is a paper done by Tom Leviste and his colleagues at, at Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health that said, what is the financial impact of, finance, of uh, healthcare disparities uh, to our healthcare system and to society? And staggeringly, and for those of you remember your economics from college, there's direct costs and there's indirect costs. Direct costs are things uh, that we do, stuff that we order, drugs, home health, et cetera, ambulance services, medical equipment. That's a direct cost. The indirect cost is the more important part. It's the loss of productivity, lost wages, missing from work and school, family leave, premature death. And so or you sort of say, okay, well, let's quantitate both the direct cost and the indirect cost of health inequality. And this is what it is, $230 billion over a three-year period, that 30% of direct medical costs faced by minority patients were excess costs due to health inequalities. $230 billion, I said, I'm sorry, correct myself, $230 billion over a three-year period. That is a lot of money that is, is not floating through or incorrectly floating through the healthcare system. And then when you throw in the indirect cost, it goes up to $1.24 trillion. This is just an economic imperative that we deal with healthcare disparities. Even if you don't believe the other stuff, my gosh, the economic imperative is, is even more 
uh, telling in terms of why we need to do something with this. So again, the economic burden of healthcare disparities, 1.4 trillion, that if we eliminated healthcare disparities, we'd have a reduction in two, almost $230 billion in direct costs, direct costs, the stuff we order, stuff we do, you'd have a 30%, 30.6% of direct medical expenditures for minorities were excess costs due to health inequalities. And that eliminating would again drop the indirect cost by almost a trillion dollars. Now that is significant cost to the United States economy uh, that health, health disparities are leading to that level of expenditure that again is not healthy for the country. And so doing nothing has a cost. If we don't address healthcare disparities, those economic numbers will get worse. Now, shifting to more current time. I will editorialize here. I am an unabashed, unapologetic proponent of the Affordable Care Act. I will go anywhere any forum, garden club, chess club, numismatics club, to talk about the benefit that the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act brought, has brought to the United States of America. As you know, this was signed by President Obama in March of 2010, and it really represents the U.S. healthcare system's most significant regulatory overhaul and expansion of coverage since the passage of Medicaid and Medicare in 1965 when President Johnson signed it at the Truman Library. Nothing, well I can't say that, that's probably unfair. Little in terms of macro changes to healthcare occurred between 1965 and 2010. Sure, we tinkered with Medicare Part D, we added some things to Medicare, we added SSDI, we added chronic kidney disability to Medicare, we did some other tinkering. But again, in terms of big macro things, it was not until 2010 under the leadership of the 44th President of the United States that we got the Affordable Care Act. The ACA provided insurance and decreased the number of those who did not have coverage. And again, the punchline here is between 2010 and 2015, the uninsured rate declined from 18 to about 10%. That, my colleagues, is significant. And again, we know we live in an era where the Affordable Care Act is under assault, even today, in the House of Representatives, they would not put in the cost-sharing subsidies back to the insurance companies, so we may have a, a, a government shutdown because of that. But again, I give the former president uh, a lot of credit. I had the opportunity to go to the White House two times during the time when the president was trying to get the bill over, and he told a group of physicians sitting in the Rose Garden, I never forget as long as I live, we're sitting in the Rose Garden, he comes out, he said, doctors, this bill isn't perfect but it beats the alternative. And he said about 80% of this thing is good, we got 20% to fix, let's get it through the United States Senate and let's go back to fix it. Well, we know what happened. It was he was never given the opportunity uh, to fix the defects in the Affordable Care Act. But look what it's done. It has engendered progress away from disparity. The uninsured rate among non-elderly individuals by race and ethnicity between 2013 and 2015. Look at the drop. Hispanics from 26% to 17. American Indian, Native American, significant drops. Uh, African Americans, Asians, whites, significant drops in uninsuredness because of the Affordable Care Act. And as I often say, the first thing you do to ameliorate healthcare disparities is put an insurance card in the hands of Americans. Whether it's a Medicaid card or an exchange card, you have to put insurance that coverage is the underpinning, the foundational piece to deal with healthcare disparities. More graphic evidence of the, the progress away from disparities engendered by. Look at it by non elderly population by income near poor, almost 30% to 18% over that time period. Uh, those who considered firmly middle class, 10% down to 7%. Uh, if you're just sort of less than 100% of federal poverty level, 27% to 17%. So again, this has been real progress. And remember, this thing was only signed eight years ago. 
it took Medicare and Medicaid about 20 years of maturation to really make a difference. And here we are at a time when we have a Congress and a president who are trying to chip away at this progress away from disparity. The uninsured rate dropped by varying degrees and look at the four largest states. Here we are, the state of New York. Look at the significant impact it's had in the state of New York. We all have relatives and friends in California. Look at the progress in California. Many of us have friends and relatives in Florida and Texas. Look here. And again, the only two states that expanded Medicaid of these two are these two. Florida has not, Texas has not. So you can see that, and I, I often say, you can draw your finger on the United States map from the DC line all the way to the deep south, all the way over to Texas. And that's where, by and large, most states have not expanded Medicaid, but for my home state, Louisiana, just did it last year. And we have some evidence that the Commonwealth of Virginia is on the verge of expanding Medicaid uh, with the new governor who is a physician, uh, Governor Northam. Uh, so again, this is real progress, colleagues, that we can't let the sophistry of the moment, the sophistry of some of the members of Congress get away with the fact that the Affordable Care Act has made a real difference. Now, look at the impact of the Affordable Care Act in a nice uh, story that was in the New York Times. Uh, this is 2013. This is where you have high, uh, high levels of uninsuredness around the country. One year later, look how the map is changing. Look at Alaska. Look at that. Look at by 2015, and look at by 2016. Most of the East Coast and the Midwest, significant improvements. California, Oregon, Washington State, significant improvements in the level of insuredness. Where's the problem? Again, you draw your finger from the DC line all the way across to Texas, maybe into Arizona, you still have huge issues in terms of folks not being able to access Medicaid expansion. And that's why we still have lots of work to do if the Affordable Care Act uh, is able to survive in terms of uh, making more progress. But this graphically shows you, colleagues, that the Affordable Care Act is working in terms of coverage expansion. Now again, right before Christmas, we were all concerned about the, the rollout of the, uh, the um, the plans because the Trump administration did everything possible not to highlight the fact that it was time to sign up, that you know they didn't do any advertising, they didn't give any grants to organizations to really push enrollment, but what happened anyway? The last figure I saw was close to 9 million people signed up for the Affordable Care Act exchange plans in spite of the Congress's and the administration's attempt to kill it. Um, the Affordable Care Act now is more popular today than it ever has been in spite of what they've tried to do, because Americans see the benefit of the Affordable Care Act, and particularly in minority communities, it is known how impactful this has been. Blacks and Hispanics saw the biggest gains under the Affordable Care Act. They're also likely to be affected by the key provisions, cuts in the federal subsidy paid to insurance companies on behalf of low-income people, provisions of the Republican tax bill that eliminate the requirement to have coverage. The individual mandate, again, has the potential to undermine threats to coverage. Now let's talk about rural. It's not just blacks and Hispanics, it's rural. The expansion states Medicaid coverage rate increased from 21% to 26% between 2013 and 2015. Non-expansion states, Medicaid coverage increased from 20 to 21 in rural areas of non-expansion states. So you can see how it's different. It just didn't stick in some of the, the rural areas that did not, in the states that did not expand Medicaid. Um, health insurance coverage among non-elderly uh, by geographic area, rural, urban, other. You can see the differences. 17% in rural, 12% in 15, again 17% in urban, down to 11, 16%, 10%, and look at the big blue part here in terms of the private insurance increase from 58 to 66%. The Medicaid increase, in spite of the several states not expanding Medicaid, Again, some progress there. Here again, another view, health coverage among non-elderly in rural areas by state Medicaid expansion. Again, expansion states, non-expansion states. You can see the difference that as of 2015, non-elderly individuals in rural areas within non-expansion states were nearly twice as likely to be uninsured as those within expansion states. 
again, the Affordable Care Act in terms of the dimension of the Medicaid expansion has made a difference in rural America. Uh, again, progress away from disparity. We've seen deaths in African American age 65 and, and over uh, decrease over the last 15 years. 43% decrease in heart disease, 38% decrease among white Americans. Cancer dropped by 30% almost, 20% in non-African Americans. Stroke, 41% decrease in stroke among African Americans, 41% in white. Matches the improvement in, in, and again, we think that the Affordable Care Act has turbocharged this progress away from disparity. Um, again, um, African Americans experienced a 25% drop in their overall death rate compared to 14% in other populations. Uh, that we've seen a decrease in deaths of all the usual suspects. Infant mortality has, de has tended to trickle down. Uh, that life expectancy gap for about a decade has, has improved uh, by 3.5 years. And now African Americans 75.6. 79 for whites. So it's, again, it's starting to converge, which is a good sign uh, that health care and having coverage makes a difference. Uh, again, progress away from disparity. Here's a, a paper in uh, cancer epidemiology. We're finding more breast cancers. The disparity gap has declined slightly. We're seeing an overall reduction in stage two breast cancer and a shift to stage one breast cancer diagnoses. That is good news, news for African-American women who tend to have higher stages, more aggressive disease, uh, early onset of breast cancer. Uh, and again, this is, again, the authors highlight in this study that closing gaps in coverage now but need to focus on the quality. Uh, that African-American women experience higher odds of inpatient mortality, longer length of stay compared with others, even accounting for differences in demographics, presentation, and treatment characteristics. So again, we think that the quality dimension now is the other part of the story that has to be embraced as we go forward. Now, what can you and I do about healthcare disparities? Well, one is understanding the culture of your patients. And we often refer to this as cultural competence. Uh, and that's just awareness of our own culture and how our own culture tends to look at other cultures and healthcare and issues that even something as simple as using interpreters in a clinical encounter can improve your cultural competence, that we need to continue to work on increasing minority representation in public health, and that we have to embrace community-driven strategies projects with a shared vision of health equity. That is incumbent upon all of us who've been given the privilege uh, to be healers in the medical, nursing, and other allied health professions. Now, the strategies are simple. This is it in a very graphical form, colleagues. We got to work on the social determinants of health. Many times we know it doesn't matter what we order with a click. If your patient doesn't have a house, if they haven't had education, if they haven't had uh, uh, other aspects uh, in terms of living in a safe environment, we're not going to make progress on healthcare disparities. So understanding that health, social determinants of health are almost equally, if not greater importance than the care we give, makes us understand how we can make progress in terms of healthcare disparities. So do not sniff at the social determinants of health. They make a difference. To wrap up, this is an incredibly important topic to me. I've uh, devoted my career to making sure that communities, no matter your race, your class, your socioeconomic status, get the care you deserve, the care that's indicated, and care that is equal in quality to any other place. And so that's why it's incumbent upon all of us who care deeply about the health of the nation uh, to understand that healthcare disparities are with us, that there is something we can do, that we are not just bystanders in dealing with healthcare disparities that we understand that there is disparate uh, result, outcome, and treatment in our system. And it's a complex thing. It's historic. As I said, ever since we started keeping records, we've always been uh, struggling with healthcare disparities. And that we need a broad, comprehensive, sustained strategy that involves us as medical professionals, the insurance companies, policymakers, to really focus in on healthcare disparities. 
We need more research on the basic science, the genomics about healthcare disparities. And this should be vigorously pursued in the years ahead. Again, community-based, community-driven, community-understood uh, uh, solutions to the social determinants of health and to health equity are needed. And that progress uh, can be made. And that this, in, in my view, is a call to action for all of us to really roll up our sleeves and to attack healthcare disparities for what they are, a drain on the productivity, the future of the United States of America, and indeed the world. Thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Riley for an engaging talk. And last year, we gave our speaker a uh, downstate sweatshirt. But I'm sure that Dr. Riley's closet is full of downstate sweatshirts. Right, exactly. So instead, yes. So what, did, what did you? She tied this up on me. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> so we're going to, yes. We're going to give so you. Where's, where's Sandra Mingo? Where is she? Sandra, stand up. Sandra makes this all possible. We have a copy of Creative Healers, oh which is a collection of essays, reviews, and poems from the magazine of the AOA, The Pharaohs, from 1938 oh, to 1998. So there you go. I, I'm, a, I'm a bibliophile, so I love that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just say one final word. Again, uh, congratulations to all the inductees. Uh, this is a great organization. Keep, uh, keep at it. Uh, excellence in medical care is important to all of us. And this organization embodies that because it is one of the things you will always cherish is your membership, your election uh, to AOA. So congratulations.